Since it's the start of the semester and if you're feeling like I am that summer ended too soon, I thought it might be kind of fun to um, take a break and still be concentrating on things that relate to our class. And so I've got um, today a class in how to make tartata because in our very first class I took some votes from you guys on what uh, possible French, classic French dishes you might want to cook are. And tartata was, which means French, um, it's a French upside down apple, apple tart, uh, was one of the requests. Now let me start by saying that when I um, usually begin to cook something, I usually, particularly if something that's classic, like a French recipe, um, many French recipes are, I look at more than one cookbook to come up with options. Now think about this as something like um, having making Thanksgiving stuffing. There isn't just one way to make it. Your mom and your grandmother and your um, dad's mom and his grandmother might all have different recipes. And that's kind of how French cooking works, particularly the recipes that are classic and so they've been around for decades or even hundreds of years. So for the um, upside down apple tart or the tart at town, and here's, by the way, how you spell tartatin. Tart is T-A-R-T-E and tatin is T-A-T-I-N. It's named after some sisters that lived in, um, in France that ran a hotel and that in supposedly made a mistake with a pie. It came out upside down and um, history was made. Among the cookbooks that I consulted in getting ready for today is the French Chef Cookbook. That's on the recommended readings that um, I have on your syllabus. Not on your syllabus is Rose Levy Birnbaum's The Pie and Pastry Bible. We'll talk about why I consulted that or why I'm mentioning that now when we get to making the crust. Baking with Julia. Julia Child is one of the great French, um, uh, one of the great Americans that brought French cooking to America in the 1950s and 60s. Um, believe it or not, there wasn't a lot of good French cooking in America um, in people's homes until Julia Child made it approachable. This is Patricia Wells' Bistro Cooking. I consulted this cookbook too, and then some of you may be familiar with um, Cooks Illustrated. It's a magazine, and they came out with a cookbook on Baking Illustrated that I find has some good tips. Anyway, um, but I ended up not, uh, my starting point wasn't any of those cookbooks, um, although I will be using Julia Child for the pie crust. I actually also went online and looked at a couple of online um, sources, which you guys may well be doing, and I found Sivour's, um, uh recipes are excellent, and so are the New York Times. And so we're going to start today with the New York Times, a um, couple of tips from this recipe, and uh, let me proceed then to talk about equipment and to what I'm doing with the ingredients, okay? So the first thing is that um, a tart tatin is made traditionally in a tatin pan. It's a copper pan that you can actually um, put directly on the heat of, of, a, of a top of an oven, or I'm sorry, a, co a cooktop, and cook directly, but you can also always use a kind of wrought iron skillet. and. Um, this is a classic kind of thing you can use instead to cook your apples. We'll talk more about that later. I'm going to be using my tart tatin. Um, when you're making a tart in France, the starting point is often a French tart pan. And they come in all sorts of different sizes. You'll want to pay attention, particularly if you're cooking a French tart, to making sure that you've got the right size. Because if you use one that's too large, your tart may burn or could get too dry. And if you use one that's too small, it can overflow and make a mess in the oven and come out too goopy. So you'll see that there are um, larger and medium and small. I'm hoping to make two tarts in our lesson today. One is the tart tatin, and another is um, just a regular fresh fruit tart, which is really simple, because um, the student that asked for tart tatin mentioned that she was having some problems with the crust. So I wanted to say there's more than one way to make a French pie crust, and um, depends on the recipe, so we'll be looking at two different recipes. But any French tart can also be made in a regular American pie pan. So here's a pie pan with some perforations that's meant to make the crust, um, stay, help the crust stay a little 
uh, CRISPR. This is, I bought it at an antique store and this was a wedding gift to my husband and me years ago. It's a French um, enameled pie pan by Emile Henri. Works brilliantly. Pies tend to come right out of this pie pan. And then of course there's also the traditional glass Pyrex, which can be really good for a tart tartin if you don't have any of these other fancy gizmos. Um, pie crusts that are cooked in glass though, you'll want to pay attention to this. They can sometimes brown more readily because um, the heat radiates differently through the glass. So then the next thing that I want to do is note that I began by putting everything in its place, by getting ready. The French call this mise en place. You put everything in its place. So I got my apples ready to go. And you'll see that I have two different kinds. One's a kind of honey crisp or pink lady. That's meant to give it a little bit of tartness and a little bit of sweetness. And um, the Granny Smiths, which are just a good solid baking apple, tart, crisp. Um, usually a French apple tart has a mix of apples. The French really love their apples. They grow them in Normandy and elsewhere. Um, but Normandy is the most famous region. We're gonna peel an apple in just a moment. But I also began by setting aside my flour and measuring cup, my sugar and salt. And we're going to be um, focusing on the pie crust in just a moment. To begin though, let me um, start by um, just demonstrating how I peel an apple. Now, you can peel an apple any way that you want. Um, a straight old apple peeler or vegetable peeler will work just fine. Um, you begin with your peeler by just sort of peeling. Um, the roommates that I had in college always took it as a point of pride if you could peel an, an apple in, when baking in one go, meaning not let the peel break. Um, you go round and round and round. That always seemed to me to be completely fussy, but I still find myself at times trying to do that. Anyway, here I'm attempting to accomplish it with a vegetable cutter. Here I'm doing it with a knife. You want a good sharp knife, shallow edge, and just rotate round and round and round. Um, it's sort of boring to watch me peel an apple, so I'm going to set it aside. I assume you've all peeled apples for, um, or may well have peeled apples for baking an apple pie at Thanksgiving time or Christmas or whenever. If you haven't, um, I bet your mom or your grandmother knows how to um, peel an apple well, and um, you can also always ask me, and I can demonstrate it more slowly. But here you can see I've almost managed to peel this apple in one go. Why does this matter? It doesn't at all. Um, the next thing that you're going to do in peeling your apple, I'm sorry, preparing your apple is of course cut it in half. We're going to cut off the um, little bit of peel and the stem at the bottom. We're going to cut off a little bit of the peel and the stem at the top, leaving just the inside. And um, I find sometimes it helps to actually quarter the apple and then we're going to cut out the core. Now the recipe that I'm working from today, which is the New York Times recipe and I'll print it out for you, actually asks for you to um, cut these up and set them aside for a day to let them basically dry out. The idea is, and they say don't worry about them getting brown because when you cook it they're going to get brown all over. Ideally you want the slices to be about the same size, that way the apples will cook evenly. So we're going for slices that are approximately an equal amount of width and if one or two of them look a little big sometimes um, you know, this one looks slightly skinnier, this one looks slightly bigger, I might, um, I might uh, trim it a little bit more. Making a crust, um, traditionally, like the way I grew up, my mother taught me to soften the butter and to mix it in with the flour. Softening the butter makes it uh, mix in more quickly. But if you read much about cooking, so that's a traditional American crust. Those kinds of crusts made that way can be a little hard. They're easy to make, but they're not very tender. They don't um, crumble nicely on your fork. Sometimes they make, they're a little hard to bite into. Um, it's about texture, not so much about taste. Um, and apropos taste, you want to choose really good flour. I recommend King Arthur's flour. You want it to be fresh. If the flour has been in your kitchen for a year or two, you'll want to spring for the cost of a fresh bag of flour if possible. And um, flour gets stale, sugar doesn't. Sugar is a preservative, so it doesn't matter how old your sugar is if it isn't too lumpy. Um, the other thing is the quality of your butter, and the French take butter very, very seriously. Um, I'm going to step to the refrigerator now. I've kept it refrigerated in order to um, make sure that it's good and cold, because one of the tricks that professional bakers do, and that I'm going to urge you to do too, 
is work with cold butter rather than room temperature or warm butter when you're or softened butter. Um, so we're going to get back to the butter in just a moment. We're going to set it aside. What I'm going to do right now is measure out the flour. And there's a trick to measuring flour you're going to want to pay attention to when you're making pastries or cakes. Um, that is that there's sort of two ways of doing this properly. One is um, you, can, um, you can scoop the flour into your cup with a spoon and you can overfill it, which you want to do so that you can just sweep off the top. All right, that's one technique. And the advantage to this is you're not compressing the flour. You're keeping it light and fluffy. Um, that'll, um, that's important for um, not getting too much flour in your recipe. Most recipes assume that you're using a method like this. The other that you can do is called dip and sweep, and that's where you dip the whole cup in. This recipe calls for a cup and a half. I'm using a half cup measure. So I've dipped it in, but I'm being careful not to press it against the size, sides of the jar or the bag or the can. Um, this is just, by the way, a cookie can that I've repurposed to hold flour. So I've dipped my flour in, I'm taking a knife, I'm skimming it across the top, and I'm getting a level one cup measure. So the half a cup plus half a cup is now one cup. I'm gonna put in one more cup of flour. I'll explain why I'm putting this in a Ziploc bag in just a moment. So I'm dipping another cup, trying not to pack it down at all, and just sweeping off the excess and bonking it into the bag. Um, Rose Levy Birnbaum, in her Pastry um, Bible, which is a very fussy cookbook, um, you might find it annoying, but it's filled with, um, or you might find it brilliant. I think most people find it brilliant. It's won a bunch of awards. Um, she recommends that you freeze your flour. You get your flour cold as well as your butter and that will make your, your crusts as, um, as uh, tender as possible. And I'll explain that when we actually come to mix things together. Um, the Tarte Tan recipe that I'm using, by the way, calls for store-bought pastry crust. And it's like, forget that. The whole point of this is to make it ourselves. So I'm looking it up in Julia Child. Julia Child calls for a cup and a half of flour, which we've measured. And then it also calls for a pinch of salt and it calls for um, a pinch of sugar, about half a teaspoon of salt and a pinch of sugar. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix these in right now, about a half a teaspoon of salt. And um, again, don't try not to measure this over your bowl, because you'll see sometimes extra gets in and you'll, you could, once you get it in, you can never get it out. So um, let's just add it in. Meanwhile, goodbye flour, we're done with you for now. And then this calls for a pinch of sugar. Some French um, sweetened pie crusts. Um, and the recipe that we're making, by the way, there's two different kinds of sweetened pie crusts that you'll see in French cooking. One is called a pâte brisée, and one is called a pâte sablé. The sablé means it's kind of sandy or gritty. It's got more sugar in it. This one calls for just a little bit of sugar. They say a pinch. I'm gonna call that a pinch. It's more than a pinch. We're gonna make it a little sweeter. We're gonna kind of toss this in, close up the bag, and we're gonna um, stick it in the freezer. You can completely skip this step if you wish. Um, classic French cooking wouldn't call for this. Um, French chefs may well use it. Um, it just depends on what your technique is. Um, I found uh, I found it takes me no more time. I'm, I'm already gonna be taking this next step that I'm about to describe now to let things chill in the freezer, I might as well um, do that with my, um, with my flour as well. So the one step that I found I really like, um, again, it's a little fussy, but it produces a really nice pie crust, is to take my butter, cut it into little pieces, and put them on plastic wrap and freeze them. And we'll, I'll show you when we're done. I'm gonna do this, then we're gonna put them in the freezer and when we come back, I'll show you what you do with them. So I'll keep some suspense here. But meanwhile, I'm taking a piece of plastic wrap. The recipe calls for 10, um, 10 tablespoons. Some recipes call for 10, some call for 11. Classic French recipes usually go by grams. So there, it's often an irregular number in, in American cooking. Um, a stick of butter, normally a quarter of a pound of butter, is eight tablespoons. So we're gonna start with one whole stick. And when I'm cutting it, I usually, to cut it into a bunch of pieces, I start with it cold, it cuts more readily that way. Cut it in half, cut it down the middle, 
cut it down maybe even down the middle a couple of times because we want it into nice little pieces. Your ultimate goal is to, to take this butter and to amalgamate it or to cut it into the flour in a way that leaves some of the butter still streaky. Not huge globs of it, but little pieces of it. Because a part of what makes a crust flaky is that um, you're basically going to get little layers of steam rising out of this butter irregularly, um, but not too irregularly, in a way that will literally make the crust puff and become lighter and um, more uh, tender as a process. Part of the tenderness is from the ways in which the moisture is incorporated. Part of it comes from not building up any gluten in the flour. You build up gluten in flour, so I cut it up and put it on the plastic wrap. And um, we're gonna add now three more tablespoons. Eight plus three is 11. So um, I'm looking for my measurements on the side. One, two, three, there's three tablespoons right there. Um, if you've ever done carpentry or baking, they usually say um, measure three times, cut once. So I just checked my measurements like three times before I began cutting up my butter. There's my three tablespoons. Again, I'm just cutting it into little bits. And uh, So anyway, um, flour, when you um, overwork it, can, get, can build up gluten, and that can make for lovely things like bread that get long and stringy, but a pie crust you don't want to get stringy. Um, you don't want it to have resistance. You don't want to be able to fling it in the air and toss it around the way that you can a pizza, pizza dough or the dough that goes into bread. Um, this is meant to be very tender and um, fragile even. Um, that crumbliness or fragility is a part of what we really like about a pie crust. So again, I'm wrapping this up in plastic wrap, trying very hard not to compress it, and I'm gonna stick it in the freezer. We finished step one. We'll reconvene at step two after I've peeled the apples and after the um, flour and the butter have hung out in the freezer for about a half an hour. And you can also do, do this in advance and come back to it tomorrow if you feel like it. But, um, but we're gonna hopefully come back to it in a, um, in a little while and we'll pick up where we left off now. Stay tuned for part two, thanks. So what we have here is um, cut up apples, which I'm gonna put in a Ziploc bag so that the apples can dry out a bit and so that I can use the bowl. So after I'm done transferring them, I wanna show you the way in which I cut, cut up one of them and then I'm gonna demonstrate for you how to make a pie crust that has um, a bit more sugar in it and it's a bit more tender. It's called a pâte sucré, or a pastry that is sweet. So a moment ago, I told you I was transferring the apples that I cut up into a bag. What I wanted to say was you saw me cutting the pieces in a relatively uniform size, but I've left one piece where I cut the bottom off the apple. And we're gonna use this at the very center of the tart as sort of a button. A lot of tartatins, they try and make a pattern that looks like a flower with the very center of the flower being a round piece of apple. It's a very traditional way to do it. So I, the way that I did it, and you can see that here, is by cutting the bottom off the apple before I started slicing it. And again, that'll anchor the middle of our tart when we get to assembling it. So I'm gonna put this in the fridge now, and we're gonna to turn to making the tart sucre. What we were beginning before was um, a pâte brisée, a slightly different kind of pastry. Um, this is a sweeter and more tender one. To begin with this, we're gonna start with um, cold, um, oh, I'm spilling sugar, cold butter, and we're not gonna freeze it. We're gonna um, leave it cold, but not frozen, because I'm gonna try and demonstrate for you how to make a pie crust by hand. The other recipe, I'm gonna show you how to make it with a food processor, but I don't assume you guys have a food processor. So both of these recipes can be adapted to making them by hand, which is the very traditional way of doing it. Um, most um, modern kitchens have, um, in France, that um, for people that have the, the means to own one, have a um, food processor, and they're often employed. It's not, it's not cheating, it's just a kind of modern convenience that accomplishes something very particular, and that is leaving the, um, leaving the dough as handled as little as possible, which makes it really tender. So we're gonna try that same technique we had before, where we're going to um, dip the flour in, 
And when we're sweeping off the extra flour, we're using the flat edge of the knife. So again, we're taking the flat edge of the knife, overfilling the cup and sweeping off the top of it. As before, we're gonna use a cup and a half. So we've scooped at um, one half cup, that another half is one cup, and here's our third cup. For that last recipe, we used just a pinch of sugar. This time we're gonna use, um, let me check my recipe. We're going to use um, a full quarter of a cup. So a lot more sugar, and I've taken out a quarter of a cup. Um, the recipe calls for, if possible, to use super fine sugar. It's sometimes also called caster sugar. The British call it caster, the French call it super fine or su super fine. Um, you can make this yourself by using regular, um, regular granulated sugar and whizzing it up in a food processor. You don't have to use super fine sugar. You'll just get um, a more amalgamated result if you do. So um, I'm gonna try and measure this out, a quarter of a cup, try not to spill too much of it. I know that I'm a klutz, so in case I spill, I'm gonna do it over a bowl so that I can pour the extra back in. And I'm just pouring a quarter of a cup. Sugar, you don't have to worry about it being overly compacted or overly settled. It's not like flour, sugar, sugar. Um, brown sugar is the exception. You do need to pack your brown sugar when you're measuring it. Um, but there's my quarter of a cup, I'm dumping it in. I'm gonna measure out a little bit of salt. The recipe calls for an eighth of a teaspoon. I've been measuring out sugar long enough that I can kind of guesstimate what an eighth of a teaspoon looks like. Um, this is a slightly over generous eighth of a teaspoon. There we go. I'm gonna throw it in. We're gonna stir it up. Okay, so we got our flour and our sugar. You wanna mix those dry ingredients first. And then we're going to cut the butter into it. So we've already cut it into little pieces. Bombs away. The recipe um, suggests that you use two knives. I've seen that many times. I never understood how you do that. I think you're meant to kind of cut it up like this. That always felt really awkward. A classic thing to use is what's called um, a pastry utensil. It's basically just a lot of little rungs. You can kind of push the... Um, push the butter into the flour like this. Um, that always feels a little um, fussy to me. Um, I just use a fork. You can use a fancy tool if you've got one. You can use double knives if you want to try and perfect that technique. And um, I'm just, if you, you don't mind zooming in, you can see that I'm basically just kind of forcing the butter into, um, into the flour with a fork. The fork is kind of breaking up the butter and um, we want to toss it periodically. The trick in doing this is not to mix too much. You want to mix as little as possible. My temptation is always to try and put my hands in there because you can feel how it um, feels better. Um, I try and resist that when I'm making a pastry, um, although I'll often put my hands in at the end just to kind of run, get a sense of the amalgamation of the flour in it. But um, your hands are warm. The fork ideally is not. And um, as a consequence, the butter is remaining cold or relatively cold as you fork it into the flour. So again, we're kind of tossing it periodically. You can see some of the pieces of flour have gotten nicely, but butter have gotten nicely mixed in. Some of them have remained big. We're trying to take those big ones and smash them into the flour. Again, your object is to mix it in, but not over mix because the more you handle flour, once it has any liquids added to it, and butter is a combination of fat and a kind of water content or whey, um, a little bit of that that retains in it, or it, butter has water in it, and um, uh, uh, in the form of whey, and often has a little bit of salt. I'm using unsalted butter, which is why I use slightly over an eighth of a teaspoon. Um, if you've wondered why salt goes into recipes, um, chemists, food chemists, have discovered that in our taste buds we taste sweet more acutely and with greater subtlety when we have a little bit of salt on our tongue as well. So we now understand why we like a little bit of salt in our sweet. It helps us to taste the complexity of the sweetness better. It's almost there. You can see I've got a few big lumps left. I'm trying to mix them in. 
The description of a properly blended crust at this stage is usually that it should look like meal or cornmeal. If you've not worked with cornmeal before, that may sound like, what does that mean? It just means it'll look a little lumpy, but evenly lumpy in the same way that a ground grain has texture, but it has even texture. It doesn't have pebbles of, you know, like stone-sized lumps in it. It's got um, kind of even, an even Steven mixture of everything. So that's what I'm trying to do now is mix everything up. Um, well, you don't want any big lumps of butter. It's better to err on the side of lumps than um, to overmix. So we're really pretty much there. Um, I didn't begin by washing my hands, so before I put them in to that flour mixture to test it, I'm gonna wash my hands and I'm gonna dry them really well because I'm um, getting moisture in the pie crust at this point will further augment the um, development of gluten. Um, I can see there's a big lump of butter in there still. Goodbye big lump. And you can see it's lumpy. A few big lumps, get rid of those. Toss it a bit to check it out, see if they're, those lumps are just casual lumps or if they're big lumps of flour. Sometimes you can feel those more readily. That is a lump of flour. Um, some of these are lumps of flour that need attention. But for the most part, these lumps, in fact, are pretty nicely amalgamated. Flour that is just flour and butter that is just starting to clump a teeny bit, which is fine, it's natural. The next step um, in doing this is we're going to add, deliberately add liquid. And uh, traditional things that you add are an egg yolk and cream. And I, so I'm gonna separate out an egg and I'm gonna demonstrate for you how I separate out eggs. There's a trick I've learned over time. You want just the egg yolk. I'm gonna rinse that egg. We're gonna crack the egg. Nothing new here, but um, instead of um, using the eggshell to separate the egg, we're going to use our fingers, which is why you have to start with washed hands. If you sort of keep your fingers loosely separated, not so loose that the egg yolk can slip between them, but enough so that the egg white can fall through, it's a very nice gentle way to separate the yolk and the egg white. So we're going to put the yolk in, in with the dough, and we're going to wash our hands again. I'm gonna refrigerate that egg white and save it for another purpose. We'll make a nice meringue. The other thing that, the other liquid that the recipe calls for is whipped cream, um, or heavy cream, two tablespoons of it. This was um, cream that I had in the freezer. And while it started to melt, um, it's still a little, uh, still a little thick. That may complicate things, let's hope it's, um, thought enough to work today. There we go. So again, we're trying to scoop out one tablespoon. It's two tablespoons in total that this recipe calls for of the whipped cream. We don't want to add too much. We really want to make sure it's, if we add too much liquid, the crust will not, um, will be too sticky. And if we have to add more flour, that will affect its tenderness. So. Everything that we're doing, we're trying to be as precise as possible. Um, and now we're just sort of cutting that in. And again, we're sort of, you'll notice that I'm sort of turning the fork around the bowl. I'm trying to both get the outside and move it in, outside in, and think of it as kind of like a lollipop that swirls in towards the middle. Um, that way we're sort of scooping both the outside and the inside, we're trying to mix it together as much as possible without over mixing. And the, the last thing that we're gonna do, so we're trying to get this to cling together. And we might not have added quite enough liquid. It still seems a little separate, but it can uh, kind of fake you out because once you start to um, draw together, sometimes the liquid will begin. Yeah, there we go. It is starting to come together. Crust. It looks like we may need a teeny bit more liquid this is the tricky part when you start to go off road from your recipe, you wanna be super careful not to overdo. So I literally added just a few more drops of cream. I'm trying to mix it in, Let's see if I can show you. I'm really more than anything trying to just draw the crust together so that it comes together into a ball. 
little dry. Could be that the egg yolks were too small. Could be that the liquid um, wasn't quite enough because um, if you know, free freezing of course makes um, liquids expand. So the volume that I was trying to measure so carefully may have been slightly less than I would normally have gotten from pure liquid whipped cream. This is one of my uh, do what I say and not what I do. I <laughs> don't don't use once frozen whipped cream from the freezer that you haven't fully thought you'll regret it. Um, but this is coming together. So you can see it's beginning to kind of cling together as a piece. And that's what we want. We want it to come together as a ball. I'm trying not to hold it too much with my hands because I don't want to melt any of the butter with my hands are warmer. If I were a real pro, I might be able to do this with a fork, but I've always only been able to kind of have luck with this by doing it with my hands. So I'm trying to, you can see it's starting to form a very nice friendly ball. And that's what we want. We're gonna form it gently, scooping up all the bits. Forming it into a ball. It's pretty nicely amalgamated. There's a few streaks. We want that actually a little bit. Um, probably could have beaten that egg white. I should have beaten the egg yolk and the milk together. That was my bad. You normally would beat those together and then we wouldn't see as much of the yellowing in here. It would have mixed more evenly. So again, do as I say, not as I do. Beat your egg yolk and beat your, um, and cream together before you pour them in. In my, in my um, focus on trying to be clear to you, I forgot that crucial step. But I think it'll be okay. So we've now um, formed that into a nice ball. I'm gonna wash my hands and I'm gonna wrap that in plastic wrap. And we're gonna put that aside to rest. Um, it's important to let the dough rest for about 30 minutes. That lets any glutens that form to ease themselves up. The longer you let something rest, the better. But we don't need to let it rest forever. And in fact, with a pie dough, you don't want to let it get too cold or it'll be hard to roll it out. So that's why most recipes call for letting it rest in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes so that the glutens get to rest, but it doesn't get too hard. This will harden up in the refrigerator. Um, so I'm gonna stick it in the fridge and we'll come back. Um, I think I actually have an appointment online in a, um, at two o'clock, so we won't be able to come back in a half an hour, um, which means I'll probably have to demonstrate for you what you do if you've let your crust get a little too hard. Um, and how to kind of soften it up a bit, but um, we'll reconvene shortly. Anyway, uh, part, part two is over. We'll come back for part three. Thanks. So when we left off, um, I was goofing on a pie crust, so I'm going to show you the correct way to have done it. I've um, combined now um, flour, butter, um, uh, sugar, and uh, uh, no salt actually um, this time. Um, and you can add a pinch of salt or not. Um, and here's our egg yolk and our cream. You should do this first before you dump it in. Mix them together. You're not beating them or anything. You're just breaking up that egg yolk and um, stirring it into the cream emulsion. And then we're gonna um, pour that in to your flour and sugar and butter. And we're gonna just basically stir it in as I was demonstrating before where you're gonna try and pull it in from the outside and make it come in, mixing it evenly, trying to do it as little, stir as little as possible, whoa, flinging a little bit around there accidentally and tilting the bowl towards you. Um, once it starts to um, have a little bit more liquid, we can put in, um, I washed my hands off camera, but I'm gonna wash them now, demonstrating you can never wash your hands too often, particularly in this COVID moment. Um, I'm making sure my hands are clean because I'm about to put them into the dish. Um, again, I think this is very unkosher. This is not normally recommended, but I find it's a really effective way of making certain things are properly amalgamated. So I'm trying to do as much as I can with a fork, stirring it without over stirring it to try and incorporate the liquid. If I need a little more liquid, I'll add a bit more cream, which I put back in the refrigerator. And um, we're, what we're trying to do is get it to cling together. It's looking like it's resisting, but we do need to start to sort of encourage it by pulling it together. It still feels a little crumbly. 
So again, the trick with working, you see it is starting to cling. That's where the dough is moist enough, but some of it isn't quite. So I'm retrieving my cream. Um, again, you can never take out what you've added, so you want to go very sparingly. I'm just adding maybe a teaspoon or so, and I'm going to stir it, trying to get it to cling. Don't want it. Don't want it too dry because it won't stick together. Don't want it too wet because then you'll have a sticky crust. And you can help a sticky crust by adding more flour, but the more you mess around with a crust in production, the more it'll be hard and not tender and not, um, you know, and if you've ever had a bad hard pie crust, you'll know what I mean. You can almost break a fork on it. Um, and that's our goal is to do the opposite of that. So you, you can see as I'm pulling it together, um, it's starting to cling to itself. And it's telling me actually that we're really, we've got enough liquid now. I'm setting the fork down because I'm not gonna use it anymore. I'm just trying to get it to um, all stick together. And I'm doing that by just kind of encouraging it to, by patting it into a ball, come together. And you can kind of roll that ball around the bottom to pick up those bits. You don't want to overhandle it, but you want to make sure you've got all those little friendly bits in there. Normally you'll sort of form it in a circle and kind of flatten it a bit because you're getting ready to um, getting ready to roll it out. And when we're going to let it chill as we did with, um, did with our other piece, which actually, um, you know, if we compare if we compare this dough with the dough that I prepared before, where I forgot to. Um, mix the, um, the egg yolk and the sugar together. Um, let's take a look at it and you'll see two things. One is what dough looks like after it's chilled. This has been in the refrigerator now for too long. Normally they recommend about 30 minutes. You can sort of see how there's like streaks of, of egg yolk in there. I forgot to mix it and a little lump of butter. I'm not worried about that lump of butter. Um, I am sad about the streaks of egg yolk that would um, make the pie crust look streaky. We can use it, it's edible, it's just a little less pretty. Um, but we're gonna put this in the fridge, we'll put that in the fridge too. And what we're gonna um, turn to when I'm done putting these away um, and washing my hands again, is we're gonna turn to how to make um, a pie crust not by hand, but using a, um, using a, a food processor. I'm gonna, we'll stop for just a moment while I wash up because that's kind of boring to watch and I'll be right back. We just took our flour and our butter out of the freezer and we're going to, what I'm about to do now is show you how to make a pie crust with a food processor, um, a tart crust. Um, I was demonstrating before how to do it with a fork. Now we're doing it with um, a food processor. When I had mixed the flour before, I had just a little pinch of sugar in it and some salt. What I'm doing now is there's a little bit more sugar here, precisely um, four tablespoons, or just slightly shy to compensate for the pinch. Four tablespoons of sugar in the food processor, and I'm gonna put the butter in here. And we're gonna food process the butter together with the sugar for about what we call 15 pulses. The advantage to pulsing over just running it is it gives you more control. The other advantage is that, as you'll see, the pulses kind of throw it up. It kind of throws it up and lands back down again, and it's a chance to kind of mix it around. So we're gonna go pulse, 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 pulse. And then we're gonna add the flour and pulse it again about 15 times. So here goes. take a look at it now you can see how it's begun to sort of break up um, the pieces are not all of an equal size which we actually would prefer that they be but it's um, the way that it's worked let me just give it a couple more pulses and now we're gonna add the flour all this is very cold and because we're not handling it by hand it's hopefully being mixed um, in a way that leaves more of the butter uh, intact in sort of larger little lumps. Those larger lumps will make a crust flaky. If you've ever had a croissant or you've ever had a French pastry that's in layers, 
part of the ways in which those layers form is the butter is um, rolled out very finely and kept separate from the layers of the butter and the flour are allowed, um, uh, the butter is left partially intact in these layers and it allows it to puff up and bake in a flaky way. So let's take a look inside and we can see um, if we poke at it with a fork that um, there are a few bigger lumps of um, butter here, but for the most part, it's starting to look like a meal into um, separate little pieces. Uh, to have avoided this, I probably should have made sure to start that my butter was in littler pieces to begin, and I had cut it into little pieces, but it looks like some of the pieces stuck to each other. So I'm just trying to break some of those big lumps up a teeny bit, or bigger lumps up with my fork. And then the last thing that we do is we add the liquid. And um, so basically every pie crust consists of a combination of shortening butter or whatever, you know, some um, old fashioned cooks use lard that makes a brilliant pie crust. It's terrible for your heart, but it's um, your, your, for your cardiovascular system, but it, it makes a gorgeous, um, very traditional crust. Um, you can use butter, you can use margarine, you can use any of a number of kinds of shortening um, and flour, usually salt, sugar if you're making a sweet crust, and then you're adding either water or egg yolk or um, cream as a liquid that will um, create the binding for this. In the last one we did cream and egg yolk. In this one we're going to add one third of a cup of ice water. I'm going to give it like one more pulse just to toss it up, and we're going to measure now one third cup. I've made a cup of ice water here and I've got my one-third cup ready to go. And I'm gonna try and measure out one cup. The ice, the water should be as cold as possible. We're trying to keep that, um, keep the um, butter from melting in the heat of abrasion. Because of course, as we're um, running a blade through it over and over again, it gets a little warm. I'm gonna try and trickle this uh, through it. Um, I'm checking my measurements, and again, that seemed like too much, and it is. What we needed was two tablespoons, not um, the equivalent of three. So we're gonna add one a little bit more. There we go, and hope that that's enough. Um, I've consulted too many recipes and I'm getting myself confused. We're using two tablespoons here. Um, yeah, here we go. Pulsing until it clings. If it looks like it needs a little more water, we'll add it. Yeah, it looks like we need more water, we're gonna add a little bit more water. Hmm? Recipe may not be wrong. using the full third cup. We might even need a little bit more. Wow, that's an unusually large amount of ice water to add. Um, but you'll see that while it looks very um, meal-like or granular, it's actually starting to clump as we pull the dough together. So I'm going to pour this out of this um, uh, bowl, um, a utility bowl, and put it into a round bowl that will allow me to mix more readily. Um, and we can do this with our hands again, or a purist, and I would probably recommend purity at this moment, would recommend a fork. Again, we're, um, we'll start with a fork, and if it refuses to amalgamate properly, we will resort to using our hands, but I'm gonna begin by tossing it together with a fork. Yep, it is refusing to come together, so we're gonna try and clump it with our hands. We're just trying to draw it together into a ball and if it, it doesn't seem to want to come together we'll add a teeny bit more water we're going to try and see if we can get it to cling together without adding more water to try and avoid making it sticky so can you see how i'm sort of pressing it together um, just to get uh to get it to um come together <laughs> 
And as before, we're trying to create it. And if you look carefully, you can actually see the butter is still um, in lumps in it, it, but very evenly distributed. That's the kind of beauty of using a food processor. It'll do this very nicely, but it assumes you have one, which for much of my young adulthood, certainly in my college years, I did not have a food processor. So you might have access to one or even own one yourself, but I certainly didn't have one until um, decades after I began baking. And de bakers throughout the centuries have done just fine without them. So, but that this will this um, can provide a very satisfactory result. I'm going to wrap this in plastic wrap and give it its 30 minute rest in the refrigerator. And um, meanwhile, uh, I'll prepare the tart tatin in the next scene. But we're going to stop now while I wash my hands and wash the bowl, and we'll transition to cooking the apples while the crust rests. This next step, we're going to melt. Um, uh, we're going to melt butter in a pan and we're going to add sugar and we're going to caramelize it. So right now I'm just putting the butter in and I'll add the sugar and we'll come back again when it started to caramelize. So see you in a minute. So I've melted the butter and I've added a cup of sugar and I'm going to stir it together and then I'm going to set the apples in. And so I'm just showing you the sugar sitting on top of the butter. We'll um, stir it up in just a moment. Um, I'm my own camera person now, so it's a little harder for me to do these two things simultaneously. Let's see if I can pull this off. Um, I'm a lefty, sorry, I'm a righty, not a lefty, and I don't want to get my camera cord into the um, stove. Ag, sorry, production issues here. I'm stirring it together just a little bit. We're going to turn it off and I'm going to nestle the apples in. When we be began, I had indicated that my pan is a little small. Recipe calls for a 10 inch pan. And mine, as you can see, is about nine and a half. And of course, because it's round in a diameter, it's an exponential problem. We're gonna have a little bit too much of the caramel at the end, and we're gonna have a little bit too much apple. That could be a problem for us with spilling over. So we're gonna make certain that we um, that I put foil underneath this, or, and maybe even a pan, otherwise you're gonna have a big sticky burned mess in your oven and a smell of burned sugar in the house isn't very charming. The other thing that we'll probably have is some leftover apples. The recipe called for eight apples. I bought, bought five big apples, so we were already using less than it called for, although apples these days are gargantuan and recipes assumed smaller apples in the old days um, before apples were hybridized to be so enormous. Um, we're going to try and fit this in as carefully as we can. We're going to start with um, our little button in the middle, and then we're going to begin on the outside by putting um, slices overlapping. Actually, what we're going to do, um, what, we're, what we need to remember is that what is up will be down. This is an upside down tart. I, keep, I don't want to forget that. So we're setting these cut edges down in a tight ring. And I will here, forgive me, I'm I'm trying to both do it and talk about it and be camera person all, all at once. So I'm going to turn the camera off and when we come back I'll have w filled this up with as many tightly wedged apple wedges as I can. See you in a minute. So I finished the first ring <clears throat> of apples on the outside. You'll notice it's kind of cut side down but we're trying to sort of fan them. Once we start caramelizing the butter and sugar in this pan, these guys are going to shrink and fall down. But I'm going to do the next ring now. I'm going to try and wedge it all in as tightly as I can and then we're going to turn the heat on to start to caramelize the butter and sugar underneath the apples. More to come. Stay tuned. We're about five minutes into cooking. You can see that the butter and the sugar are bubbling away. The color hasn't darkened yet. Um, it's not, in other words, started to caramelize, but it's definitely getting quite hot. So you're going to want to be careful when you're cooking your apples in the caramelizing sugar and butter, not to um, get, not to touch the pan, which will be super hot, and not to touch any of the ingredients with your bare hand either, because you can get a really serious burn from um, sugar and butter at a really high heat. It's a quite burning, lingering heat, and if you accidentally get any on yourself, just stick your hand under cold water as quick as possible. Anyway, we've got about another um, five to eight minutes to go. So I'm going to turn this off. Um, we'll come back when the color has started to change. The apples are getting more tender. But there's a bunch of different ways of doing this, by the way, and some call for you flipping the apples over partway through, 
others call for just leaving it exactly as it is. Um, I may take a middle ground and sort of flip the apples that are in the middle layer, which are sort of lying half on top, to try and get them to cook a little bit more in keeping with um, the higher heat that the wood apples below are being exposed to. But um, anyway, we're, uh, we're making progress. And um, when we come, when, when it's done, I'll show it to you and then we'll stop actually and let it rest. Um, the recipe does not call for that, but I'm just going to do that. I find it's easier to put the pie crust on top when this is not so scorching hot. And I can see the progress that the apples and the caramel are making before the crust is on it. Well, some recipes have you put the crust on top right now, but I find that it makes it kind of melt, and I really, you lose all that flakiness and all the cold butter that we've been working so hard to get. So this is just one way of doing it. You cook the apples in the caramelizing sugar and butter first, and then you, um, when it's not too hot, you put the crust back on top and you pop it in the oven. And I haven't even started preheating the oven yet because I figured maybe I'll do this in about an hour or so when the pan isn't so hot. But um, anyway, you can see that this is the sort of thing you can do over the course of a day, which is basically what I've done, turning it into a series of study breaks. You can also just do it straight through, in which case um, this wouldn't take quite as long as we've taken so far because right now we've made three crusts, peeled up apples, and begun to cook them. Anyway, um, so uh, we'll come back when the um, caramelizing is a little further along. So the apples are basically done, and I actually had turned the temperature off um, and then realized I'd maybe turn it back on to show you what it looks like when it's caramelizing. Um, normally the heat would be quite high, it would be bubbling away really, so I'm turning up the heat for just a moment so you can see it bubbling while it's caramelized. And you see how the butter and sugar have begun to turn brown. They are literally turning to caramel. And notice too how the apples have fallen down. They've kind of shrunk a bit. And um, the one thing when I said before what I might do is um, not flip the apples so much as um, poke them in. So one of the things that happened was as they were boiling, the apples were kind of jostling and I just kept nestling them back in place. At the very, very beginning, in fact, I slipped a few little more pieces of apple in, kind of between the layers, just because you want to keep it as tight as possible, and the apples are actually shrinking, and as they shrink, they get looser and they can jostle around. Um, the slices on top have cooked slightly less than the ones on the bottom, and that's just kind of a casualty. I tried to flip these a few times. Um, just to let them get exposed to more cooking, you can see, for example, how this one on the lower layer is almost thoroughly cooked through and become almost translucent, whereas these ones on the top are a lot more opaque. But the one thing to pay attention to, um, just for presentation's sake, is trying to keep these going in a concentric circle. You're kind of layering them in a circle and then layering them in a circle. You want it to look really pretty so that if the crust falls away, there'll be a pretty pattern here. But remember that the real pattern that's happening is on the other side because this is an upside down tart. So in the once this is cooled some, we're going to layer the um, pastry dough, which we're going to roll out later. Then we're going to put this in a hot oven. But we'll do that um, after this is cooled down a little bit. And again, there are ways of doing this where you don't have to let it rest. There's no magic to letting it rest here. It's just I find it's easier to put the crust on when the pie isn't, when the tart pan isn't so hot. This The handles are, are quite hot and the pan itself is very, very hot. So we'll come back to this um, later. Thanks. Hi, so yesterday um, I made three, uh, three crusts. We're looking at one of them now. This was the crust that ma I made in the, um, in the food processor and you can actually see the butter freckled in it. It has a slightly different quality, which in certain ways is superior to the version that you accomplish when making it by hand, which is what I'm showing you there. Um, what I'm also showing you is the tart that I've already rolled out in a French tart pan. Um, you can see that I built it up over the sides. I'm gonna roll one out in just a moment and demonstrate how I made it look this way. And then here again is the tart tatin that, woo, started to slide that um, we caramelized yesterday. So um, in preparing the dough, you'll remember that we uh, mixed this up and um, uh, then I was supposed to let it chill for about 30 minutes. I left it in overnight. Um, it's very strongly recommended, this is probably noisy, I apologize. It's very strongly recommended that you roll out a pie crust between parchment paper. Parchment paper is unwaxed, at the end of it, um, you dispose of it. It has many uses. 
um, I am going to use it to bake that crust in what's called brine. That means baking it without um, any filling in it. And I'll show you how I'll do that using pie weights in, um, in a moment. But meanwhile, I've taken my um, I've taken my dough out. I'm going to put a teeny bit of sugar, and I'm, what I'm using here is a silicone pad. If you don't own one, that's fine. You're just going to want to take a, a little bit of flour, not too much. Flour your hands, flour the surface. Choose your rolling pin. Um, I'm actually gonna, probably going to use two. I used two yesterday. That's pure gluttony, I know that. Um, not everybody owns two of them, and in fact, if you don't own a rolling pin, you can substitute a bottle of white wine. They usually say white wine is better than red wine because they have a softer slope in the shoulders. It makes just it, um, and you want one obviously that has no embossments in the bottle. You should wash the bottle, make sure it's clean, and dry it. Um, the surface should be completely dry. You'll get yourself into a lot of trouble if it isn't. So then I'm going to put a, a piece of parchment paper down. Um, I'm going to pick up a little bit of this flour and put it on the parchment paper. I've, but I've lightly floured both sides of the, um, the dough and I'm putting another piece of parchment paper over it. You'll see why I'm doing that in a moment. Now, um, I don't usually like using a marble rolling pin. They're very heavy. But when dough is cold, a heavy rolling pin is helpful. What I usually do is pick up the dough and move it periodically for two reasons. One is you want to get a nice even um, a nice even distribution and um, you want to spread the dough out evenly and kind of rotating it and moving it is one way of doing that. The other is you're trying to make sure it doesn't stick. So I periodically pick it up, dust it on each side as lightly as possible. I'm trying to roll this out. Now I know how big I need this to be because I've got a pan that is nine and a half inches wide. So I need this to be bigger than nine and a half inches wide. And what I'm doing now is rolling, 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 checking it periodically to make sure it's not sticking, dusting it just lightly with flour, putting it back down again. You'll see that it's cracking some on the sides. That could pose a problem, but with this kind of a sweet crust, you can actually patch it relatively easily. So we're gonna be patching this when we put it into the pan, perhaps. Um, if we need to. Okay, I'm trying to um, create a nice, even surface. Now that I've done the heavy work, I can actually switch. This is a French style rolling pin. It has no handles on it. It's basically just a stick. Um, the taper is a little bit at the edges because normally the way that you push, you're actually pushing a little bit um, you tend to pull more at the edges, the edges tend to be thin, so you'll actually see it slightly wider in the middle. It, in the end, the idea is anyway, that you'll produce a more even crust. Um, I may want to stop at this point, so you can see it's beginning to stick. So that's part of why you want to stop. Again, you just look, pull up a little bit of that flour on your hands, just a teeny amount, run it across the surface to try and um, Dust it with flour, not too much. It'll make your dough tough if you add too much um, flour to it. If you need a little bit more, you can toss it in. But less is so much more when you're making a pie crust. Too much dough and you'll get yourself into, too, sorry, too much um, flour and you'll, uh, you'll, toughen your, you'll toughen your dough. But what I'm gonna do now is just sort of come over, look at it and go, yeah, not quite big enough. Um, so I need to roll it out a little bit more. Trying to make it um, round and I'm trying to make it even. By pushing out, we're trying to enlarge it. Pushing out from the middle and pulling back. Um, you can feel with your hands how uh, normally, and you'll have, you have to trust me on that, because right now you're looking, not touching. Um, I could feel that it was a little thicker on this side and a little thinner here, so I'm gonna concentrate my efforts on this side. I've taken away the paper um, because I wanna be able to see what I'm doing here. We're gonna have a lot of extra dough, I think, at the end, because this pan is small. 
as I said yesterday, the pan is about a half an inch too small. It was the only tartatin I could find. Um, years ago, when I was looking for a tartatin, it was on sale. I left upon it. They're very hard to find in America, the copper French tartatin pans. Um, they're characteristic of the shape of the little handles that you were seeing, so that you don't have to pick it up when it's got that molten sugar and butter in it. But uh, anyway, I've kind of rolled it out. I'm feeling with my hands to see how even it is or is not, and it feels pretty good. It's a little thick. Thinner, thinner crust is more elegant, but it'll also be more apt to tear. Um, this is going to be a tasty crust, I think. She says patting herself on the back, so I don't mind that it's a little thick. Um, so what I was just doing, I was testing to see if the size is big enough, and it's absolutely big enough. So I'm going to basically um, invert this on top of the pan. Then what I'm going to do, I'm pulling off the paper. I'm going to kind of snug it in. Now, with a tart tatin, the tart gets turned upside down. You basically are baking it with the bottom up, and then when you're done, you're gonna turn it upside down, and the apples are gonna be on the top, and the crust is gonna be on the bottom. So, um, so we really don't want, unlike an American pie, where we have this beautiful um, fluted edge, we don't really want that here. We're gonna trim this on all the way around. Um, so part of why I'm poking it in is I am trying to um, get it down to the level of the fruit and then using a not sharp knife because I don't want to damage the tin lining which is sort of like a, um, a medieval renaissance version of, of silicone I mean it's a it's not a non-stick surface but it um, it sticks less than copper um, most copper pans are lined with tin, they're less reactive, we'll put it like that. It's actually not so much about sticking as not giving taste. Copper will leave a taste, tin does not. But it, tin will scratch, so we're trying to use a soft edge to cut this dough, and we're just taking off the extra dough. Now, if we were not gonna be flipping this upside down, we could do all kinds of fun things with that extra dough. We could make leaves and roses and decorate the top of this with dough. It would look very pretty, but we don't need it for that. You can bake this up and put cinnamon and sugar on it and just eat it as a treat. You can um, do anything you want with the extra dough. You can, in fact, put it, pinch it into little, tiny little tart pans and make little pans for um, your uh, baby brother or sister's teddy bear. Um, it makes for a great child's tea, but um, it's basically scraps now. These are not things that we need. So we're cutting away this extra crust leaving just the size that we need inside the pan. And uh, uh, that's all that I need to show you for now. I'll, I'll pierce the bottom of it in just a second, take a photograph of that for you, and um, show it to you before I pop it in the oven, but I don't think we need to see any more of this for the moment. Thanks. So here's the tart. I've pierced the top of it because what happens when it bakes is that steam is going to rise both from the apples but also from the crust itself. The moisture from the crust is going to make the crust puff up. And if you don't poke little holes in it all over, it's going to puff up irregularly. So we're doing that to try and get it to be an even surface. Um, and I've done, of course, the same thing in the pie crust that we're gonna bake blind. The other thing you can notice is that I've put this into a pan that I've lined with aluminum foil. Now, don't feel like you need to have a copper pan to bake this in. You can absolutely do this in any kind of a pan. A skillet, which I showed you yesterday, will work equally well. Um, can be a little harder to flip it upside down if you're, um, if your metal um, skillet is not well seasoned, but hopefully your skillet is. Anyway, I'm gonna put this in the oven and then I'm gonna show you how to prepare um, the other tart pan for being baked blind. And then we'll see what happens when this comes out. I may roll out the other um, bit of dough, I may not, we'll see. But anyway, um, we have enough dough to make three tarts. And the mo for the moment, we've completed everything but baking one of those tarts, here it is. What we're looking at now is um, the finished tarte à which I pull out of the oven. You can see that um, the crust is um, browned. I, I may actually put it back in for just a few minutes. It's looking a little more browned in some parts than others. I may rotate it and just give it a little bit more. But they say the tart should be, the crust should be um, firm, and it, and it is. 
and the um, interior should be bubbling, and it is. Um, and what we're looking at here is um, an unbaked tart that is so-called baking blind. I put in um, parchment paper, and then inside it I put in little ceramic weights that'll hold the sides up when this puffs up and the sides might want to fall in. If you don't have pie weights, no worries, you can use rice or beans, but I'm going to put this in the oven and bake it without a filling, and I'll show you what we do with that when, we're, when it's done. But meanwhile, I think our tartata is done. Um, I'm just going to give it a little tap, and yeah, the crust seems done. I may rotate it and put it back in for about three more minutes, and then we'll declare it done. And I'll show you how you invert it at the very, very end, as the tart tatin gets turned upside down. Um, but I'll show you that later. Here we go. What I'm going to do now is take this tart, which is done, and turn it upside down on the plate before us. Um, because I am my own camera person for the moment, um, I'm going to have to do it and then show you how it uh, went. So I'll turn it upside down. Actually, what I'm going to do is take the plate, turn it on top of the um, pan, and then I'm going to flip them one over another. Probably going to do this um, with something underneath it to catch drips because it's likely to drip. And um, then we'll unmold it and see how it looks. The tart has come out and it actually looks pretty good. Um, you can see that the rose isn't quite perfectly located. Some of the apples have migrated so that it doesn't look like a perfect flower. That's all right. This is not about perfection. Perfection is not of this world. Um, what I'm doing here is just tidying it up a little bit with a clean piece of paper towel, wiping off the drips and um, declaring the tart done. Uh, meanwhile, I heard the timer go off and I'm going to take the um, tart that I was baking blind out. So hang on a second. What I'm doing here with this last remaining crust is I've rolled it out with the parchment paper and I've inverted it over a tart pan, a French tart pan like we used um, for the one that is already baked. There it is again. Um, and I'm going to um, basically repair places where it's torn. Um, as I'm going to try and create a tiny lip, like there's some places here where I've begun to repair it. I'll show you what it looks like when I'm all done. Right now it looks like it's kind of a mess and I actually let the dough get very warm. It's quite soft now, which was probably a bad idea. Um, I got distracted by working on my syllabi readings for you guys, but um, here it is right now and um, I'll show it to you before I pop it in the oven later. Bye. What I'm doing now is taking our prepared pie shell and I've beaten together three egg yolks and three quarters of a cup of creme fraiche. Creme fraiche is kind of a French version of sour cream, more tangy. It's made by culturing um, cream. And uh, uh, ugh, three tablespoons of sugar. And I'm going to pour this into the tart pan, put raspberries on top and bake it. We'll sprinkle it with powdered sugar at the end and it'll be done. So you can see that these kind of um, pre-baked pie shells can be very useful. You can make a tart pretty quickly if you've got the basic ingredients, whipping together the cream, the sugar, and the eggs. It really just took a few minutes. Let me put it together, show it to you before I put it in the oven, and I'll pop it in the oven. The tart's ready to go in. It's a 375 oven. It's supposed to be cooked for about 15 minutes. Here goes. So the tarts come out of the oven, and you can see that um, basically the um, creme fraiche and the eggs and the sugar have cooked together to make a, a light custard. And the recipe calls for you to sprinkle the tart with a little bit of powdered sugar, and then to let the tart cool and eat it when it's cool. So that's, it's ready to go. I'm just sprinkling it now. I put a little bit of powdered sugar in a sieve basically took two packages of um, two packages of uh, raspberries and um, the recipe came from Patricia Wells Bistro Cookbook Tato Framboise um, Café du Jura so a raspberry tart and from the Patricia Wells Bistro Cooking and I'll um, what I'll do is uh, copy the recipe for you guys so that you'll have it and um, meanwhile bon appetit